the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So a little bit later this summer, we're going to mark the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. It was August 29th when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast with excruciating, devastating slowness and with unrelenting force. Yeah, but that's what hurricanes do. They, they move very slow and their squad can sometimes be very, very wide. They move so slow that their path is on its own sometimes days in advance. And then you just get ready. And then you wait for it to rise. And then you endure it and ride it out when it hits. And the fear of storms like that is slowly unfolds as the intensity of it picks up as well. The aftermath of Hurricane Katrina left 99% of the state of Mississippi without power for days and in some cases weeks. Even 150 miles inland, the devastation was amazing in extreme. Five Episcopal churches along the Gulf Coast were slabbed. That's what we call buildings and houses and churches when there's nothing left but the space where they once stood. Well, thankfully, all the churches have been rebuilt. But there's many other structures, as, as, as all the Gulf Coast has been rebuilt. But you can see, if you go there, you can see that there are what I like to call blank spaces, those places where structures never return. Now, with the exception of Hurricane Sandy, which hit not too far from this area, it seems like things have been relatively quiet on the hurricane front these last 10 years. And having experienced only the Gulf Coast hurricanes, I was surprised when I found out about Sandy's unique destruction. Having spent recently a few days out in western Maryland, when Sandy hit up there, created massive, heavy, wet snow that literally crushed trees and crushed power lines and, of course, came in roots. You can still see some of the destruction left behind by Hurricane Sandy out in western Maryland, even now. By contrast, the storm that hit the Sea of Galilee and that small contingent of folks that Jesus was part of, that storm hit with sudden fierceness. One moment, it's calm, and the next moment, the waves are churning. The instant reaction, you might expect, but certainly if you were there, would be a fear. Now, the Sea of Galilee is, is a large inland lake. It's certainly the largest in that area where Jesus traveled. And as you well know, some of Jesus' companions make their livelihood by, by fishing that lake out of these waters, notably Peter, who is our patron and our namesake. But by greater standards, the, the Sea of Galilee really isn't all that large. It's 13 miles long and about 8 miles wide. But even so, at that size, the storms on the Sea of Galilee are notorious. That's because, as you've heard from the story today, they literally come out of the blue, or maybe in this case, come out of the dark, because it's the close of the day, when Jesus and his companions got into the boat. But I'm told that the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by narrow ravines, so that off to the northeast and then to the east. And when the wind comes with it over and around the mountains that are farther out in that direction, when they come to the ravine, it's funneled down through that narrow space. And when they do hit the water, they hit it in frightful fashion. And it's enough to scare even the seas and boats. So the story goes. At the end of a long day, Jesus says to his friends, let's go on across to the other side. And you've heard as the events unfold, a huge storm just like that comes up. And the waves pour into the boat, threatening to sink it. The other disciples and the other passengers, they, they go to wake up a, a sleeping Jesus. They shout, we're dying here. We're dying here. What are we going to do? And again, as the story unfolds, Jesus Conway says in the face of the storm, peace, be still. I think that Jesus said that, certainly in the face of the storm. But he could easily have said that into the faces of his companions. Peace. Let your hearts be still. And there was indeed a dead calm. And his friends are incredulous. Yeah, and they're saying to each other, Who is this God? But I think that we do this event no justice if we only consider it to be a miracle of nature. Because in all likelihood, it happens once with Jesus, and never.
your hand. So you could call this a one-time event. And if that is true, what good is this story for us today? Of course, naturally, I want you to consider the larger context, the bigger reality behind what's going on here. In the Jewish world and in the Hebrew mind, water is chaos. And chaos represents the absence of God. So then, chaos is lack of order. And in that context, you can see dangerous storms as they can be seen as having a demonic purpose. By demonic purpose, I say that because nature and creation are used for evil and destruction, not for the purposes that they were intended or created to be. So, step back for a moment. Let's go back to the creation story in Genesis. And in that, Spirit of God moves over the chaotic water. And God speaks. God speaks in creation, and creation itself is ordered and stabilized. And chaos is no more. And from that point on, the universe grows forth with the Spirit of God and is sustained by that very same Spirit. And if the storm comes to an end around Jesus, it means that they see firsthand that God's Spirit is there. Remember last Wednesday, but the last Wednesday just a grand and glorious celebration. It was, it was just one. And in the context of that celebration, this is what reminded us that the Spirit is the breath of God. The breath of God is God breathing. You've heard that wonderful story about those dead dry bones. And God breathes on them with his breath, his bones on them. And God breathes on their flesh and blood. God breathes and they're animated into a community of God of sin and sin. And that is, that is us. That is God breathing through us this day who restores us breathing and vibrancy to build And if there is one thing that this community can say to our friends at Emmanuel A. E. Church in Charleston, South Carolina, is that God will continue to breathe on you. We know that because God has breathed on us and we are living, breathing proof of a new spirit and new life that has grown here. Friends in Charleston may not realize that at this point because I guarantee you they are experiencing a good pride. We can tell the story to them of what happened after good pride. The Spirit of God brings new life into a community of faith. I'm sure that it will happen to them with as much certainty as it happened here. At the end of the long run, again, Jesus says to his friends, let's get into the boat and let's go across to the other side. In the context of this, they've been spending time on the shores of Lake Galilee with a large crowd of people by the sea, teaching, answering the questions, a day of opening to the Spirit to, to the breath of God. But let's go to the other side, Jesus said, and it means here more than just a change of scenery. Again, in the geography of the Sea of Galilee, the other side is kind of a dangerous place. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the storm that they encounter. You see, the other side, which Jesus refers to, is Gentile territory. That's not where Jewish people are. So it's kind of an alien in a foreign place to them. So by going to the other side, Jesus is intentionally going there to reach out to those who are different. So let me ask you this. Who then are those ones who are different and in need of the fresh breath of God that we can provide? Jesus' actions mean something to a world that struggles with acceptance and inclusion, and we also struggle with fear that these events have to show us. Have you no faith? Have you no faith, Jesus says, as the calmness returns to him? I mean, if you look around, look around and see what's happening. I can say that to you, too. Look around you and see what's happened over these years. 
What then faith? What is faith for you? Faith. At its most basic, at, not saying that it's simplistic, but at, that as, it, uh, as we can articulate this, at its most basic, faith is trust. Trust that the Spirit and the breath of God will continue to breathe upon this people. Just as the breath of God will continue to breathe in Charleston, South Carolina. Faith is to trust that the breath of God can do even greater things than we have experienced. So yes, Jesus and his companions weathered the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Hurricane Katrina eventually dissipated into nothing more than a large rainstorm far inland. The top of the storm this past week is drenched Texas and actually showed up here apparently last time. Reminds us that chaos and disorder will always try to improve and always try to intervene on our lives. Remember what the Lord said. He, be still. Be at peace. Let your heart be still. And no faith. Of course you do. The Spirit of God breathed through the presence of Jesus to his friends. The Spirit of God breathed through the presence of Jesus in this community. We are witnesses to that. And the Spirit of God breathed through Jesus in, in the presence of God to all of those who are out there on the other side. All of those that need that fresh breath of God.